people, welcome to a wonderful afternoon slash evening of poetry. The thing I like about this crowd is you show up early, you sit in your chairs and you don't move. You're like so happy to have these spots. Uh, people started showing up at five o'clock, which was incredible. 10 to five, see, see what enthusiasts we have for the spoken word? I'm Brandon Ranches, the senior curator here at MAM, and we're delighted to have Mark Gibbons here at the conclusion of his role as Montana Poet Laureate. I think that's just really fantastic. Uh, it's really an honor to serve in this capacity, as you know, and it's an honor to have him here tonight. We're grateful for the support of Humanities Montana, and I wanted to say thanks for helping support this program. Um, the last time I heard Mark read, it was at uh, the release of the Charlie Bees triptych, which uh, Aaron printed uh, through Territorial Press which included all sorts of bar poems that Mark, uh, Kurt, and Dave wrote, much in the manner, of course, of Hugo and Welch and that other guy. So it was really great uh, kind of following that. And I haven't heard you read since then, which I thought, God, that's been over five years. What the hell happened? That's way too long. So it's pretty great. Um, you think about Mark and you think about Missoula and doing projects like the Charlie B's poems. And <clears throat> Mark's about as Missoula as it gets, and really loves this place. This museum has a long history of presenting poetry readings, and I hope, you, hope you've caught some of them. Show of hands, have you heard poetry here? And, yeah, I'm just curious. We're, we're working on formalizing this into some sort of a series, which uh, we're excited about. Most recently, I think we had Vic Charlo and Deborah Erling read. As most of you know, um, Ma'am sits on a confluence of valleys, which is the home of the Salish and Kalispa, or Salish and Pongare, or Upper Kalispell people. And we're about 20 miles south of the nearby Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes reservation. But in truth, this is where they've lived for thousands of years. And it might sound like a little bit of a, a rote land acknowledgement. You know, we always start programs this way. But um, I wanted to point that MAM tries to keep this uh, as present or future tense, thinking, thinking about the, this relationship here. Um, and we see how uh, this relationship infuses so many relationships across our community in numerous ways daily, from a vibrant Native Studies department, ongoing indigenous makers markets, uh, the annual powwow, um, we do it here at MAM through uh, a dedicated gallery, which is just across the way where Taryn Laskun's exhibition is on display and finishing up through this Saturday. So if you haven't seen that show, I hope you're able to. And then with our uh, collection, a, a dedicated focus on our permanent collection, which has now over 250 objects by contemporary American Indian artists, or 253 if you count the three that we just purchased from uh, Taryn or he gave us. So. Thank you for coming tonight. I wanted to ask you to please silence your cell phones, and I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, who's going to give a proper introduction for such an esteemed poet. Thank you. Yay. I don't know how proper of an introduction I can give. <laughs> so Pressure's on. Especially because you all know him. Uh, but I like what uh, Brandon said about uh, a Missoula experience. I, I, when I think of Missoula now, I think of Mark and Dave. I went to college here many years ago, and uh, it's you know bittersweet to come back here and see how everything has changed. Um, like Dave Thomas's beard, I swear he used to be red. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long I ago I lived here. Um, but, you know, I knew I was coming to Missoula, and I thought, man, I'm so looking forward to some different food from Helena. I'm going to find something good to eat. And I wandered all around, and then I ended up eating at the Ox. Oh. <laughs> In honor of Mark. Um, I don't know what I can say about Mark that you don't already know, but I'll just tell you a little of my personal experience. I'm, I can't even remember how we met, but uh, I first got to know him doing the Charlie Bees thing. And I did spend a lot of time in Charlie B, so it was a natural topic to print. And I just got in this printing press and wanted to do something kind of involved, and it was really involved. <laughs> Had to run it through the press like eight times to get everything on it. Um, and then we did this great performance one afternoon at Charlie B's on a Sunday. 
And I knew it was going to be good when I heard some drunks at the front complaining about poetry on a Sunday. <laughs> but miraculously, when they started uh, reciting, every, everything got quiet. It was a really magical experience. I was really glad to be a part of that. So I happened also to be uh, executive director of Drum Women Institute, which publishes, you know, Montana writers, um, most of whom have either been forgotten or you know, haven't been published before. And so when Mark brought us a manuscript, I was super excited to do it, and that's In the Weeds, which uh, is one of my favorite books of poetry. I was super honored to have been a part of it at all. And the shout out here on the back pretty much says it all. This collection is a flamethrower. <laughs> that's Richard Fifield, if you know him. Uh, but it's a great book, and I'll just maybe conclude by telling you this little story about it. You know, when you print a book, you end up with hundreds of copies floating around. And I was delivering them all over the state, and a stray one ended up underneath the seat of our car. And my wife and I, and our daughter, who at the time was probably eight or 10, was in the back seat, and we're driving to Butte. And she's rummaging around under the seat, and she's like, what's this? And she opens it, and she started reading a poem, and it must have been one of the ones that has an F word in it, because she started laughing. Uh, and then my wife got the book, and she read a poem. I was driving, of course. Um, but the whole 60 miles from Helena to Beat, we just read poems out of this book. It was awesome. Um, and if there's one thing that Mark taught me about poetry, I was not a poetry guy before I started hanging out with guys like him and Dave. Um, it's that it has to be recited, it has to be read out loud. It's a whole different experience, the poem on the page versus the poet on the stage. So I'm really grateful for having learned that. I look forward to hearing him read right now. All right. All right, well, thank you, Aaron. And... Uh, this is terrific. <laughs> uh, I'll get all verklempt right away. It was like the last time I was here, you know, was for Vic and Deborah's thing, right? And, and Vic's sitting up here, and he sees all these people that he knows. And it's like, oh, oh, god damn, look at all these people that I, I mean, everybody that, that you know shows up. So it's a, it, I mean, I don't know that there's anybody out there that I don't know. So, I mean, if, if I don't know you, I look forward to meeting you later. Thank you for coming. And I want to thank Brandon. I mean, uh, I was in here to see this show. If you haven't spent any time to take a look around and see what this guy does, this Tyler, Tyler, Krasowski, yeah, man, he's incredible. And I was here with my uh, my son and daughter-in-law, and we were checking this out. And Brandon was came over and said hi, and said, you know, you want to do a reading? Have you done a reading in Missoula? And he was like, no. So yeah, this is a good idea. Let's do it. <laughs> and uh, and of course, the very the first collection, my first collection of poetry was was read here. Uh, you know, Laura. Uh, allowed me to come in here and and uh, and do a poetry reading, and every, I knew everybody at that damn poetry reading too. It he <laughs> it helps to be born here, and then you know everybody that's going to show up in the goddamn audience. So, anyway, uh, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I need to thank Humanities Montana. Also, Jill is here as that representative. John Knight has been great uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, helping me do whatever the poet laureate's supposed to do, and uh, I've done more than most. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, one of my girlfriends, a former poet laureate, sitting right behind you. She did a hell of a lot too. Cheryl Cheryl Nothy, who who is responsible for for the like 25 to 30 years that I've been working with kids in Missoula, Montana, through the Missoula Writing Collaborative, which is the best goddamn nonprofit in the state. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, that was one of the projects. And we, and we'll, we can uh, hopefully have a little bit of time at the end of this to, if you have any questions or you want to talk about anything like that related to uh, 
whatever the hell the poet laureate is. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and but I'm going to go ahead and just uh, hit my famous stopwatch and uh, yeah, kind of try to keep track of the time so I don't get carried away because I can't keep track of time. I thought that I maybe would. Uh, Start with, I mean, I don't know, I know everybody, I feel like I'm telling you the same damn story you've heard a million times, but I, I grew up in a little town called Alberton, just west of here, it's a Milwaukee railroad town. And uh, I was in high school, and all of a sudden the English teacher said, how many of you would like to get out of class for the next couple of weeks <laughs> and attend a poetry workshop? And it was like... <laughs> Yeah, I do. And I was already interested in poetry because we had good English teachers. And like freshman and sophomore year, I started reading for the first time. And I started, and poetry was one of the things that really I dug, you know. I mean, I loved Shakespeare. I didn't know what the hell was going on, but I just loved it, listening to it. We read it out loud, you know. You had to read Shakespeare out loud in class, right? So, so anyway... Um, at, uh, at that point, I thought, yeah, I'm ready for some, some poetry stuff. So I went, and the, and the poet was, uh, was from the Montana Arts Council, who has been wonderful and done all kinds of things for me over the years. The poet was James Welch. Oh. And he was just a, you know, a post, he wasn't quite a postgraduate student because he never graduated. <laughs> but, uh, but he had... Uh, he was just trying to do some work, and he was working on his first manuscript, which was a collection of poetry, which turned out to be writing the Earth Boy 40. And those are the poems that he was using in this workshop experience to teach us how to think about writing poetry. So uh, from that, I started writing poetry in 1970, 16 or whatever, and uh, it was just like wonderful. It was like freedom. It was liberating. It was like I think I can do this the rest of my life. I mean, nobody ever has to see this. That's the beauty of it, right? <laughs> and, and of course, nobody should see most of it that I wrote back then. And uh, so, so, uh, so anyway, I, I just kept writing poetry. And uh, at some point in time, I, uh, I wound up uh, in a situation. I was teaching high school, and uh, I was uh, in... Uh, I was in Augusta, Montana, and in Augusta, uh, I ran into uh, a poet who was working for the Arts Council, and his name was uh, uh, Paul Zarziski. And Paul lived in just outside on, of Augusta on Flat Creek, and he came in and did a workshop with all my kids, and uh, so I got to write. I got to join the workshop and be like a poet, which was very cool. And uh, so I wrote this poem, so it's like, uh, and this poem is, uh, is in this book, uh, along with uh, another poem from this little thing, which is the first chapbook I ever did, and I paid for it. Uh, a, little, a, a printer in Whitefish published this chapbook of poems, and this poem was in there, so I'll read it. I feel like just <laughs> chugging that thing. Maybe I'll just go like this. Mmm. There it is, a drinking vessel. All right. <laughs> it's called Spoiled Rotten. I was a rich kid in Alberton, pampered inside an old two shack, shiplap, slapped together house right beside the Milwaukee Railroad. Creosote ties, footed, faded linoleum floors, they supported us like trains to the splintered end. Barren beaverboard walls bled frost and our dreams. We were rocked by vibrations of a westbound freight. Electric engines and diesels rattled windows and teeth. Promised fear could be soothed by iron. A worn groove on the coal chute door sill lip made a perfect rifle rest. That shed Fort Apache held our secrets like swallow and wasp nests. September nights, bears came for our trash. We waited breathless, dug down in sleeping bags, clutching flashlights and holding our water. Our hearts raced like hummingbirds. Each hour, another fantasy indulged. Skittish deer found dinner along the tracks, nosed wheat-spilled meals in the snow. Dawn and dusk, 
white tails twitched at us. But we were spoiled most long summer days, tormenting rattlers and climbing castle rocks, skinny dipping and fishing up Petty Creek from the Narrows to the old goat farm. We swam the Clark Fork like beaver, circled and slapped, through hoots and full cannonballs. We gorged ourselves daily like Romans or kings, eating filthy rich feasts, everything in season, green apples, ripe plums, wild onions, and garden-raided dirt-sweet carrots. We discovered the neighbor's basement, ate jars of silver salmon, and gagged <laughs> smelling Limburger cheese. We sipped on sour dandelion wine, felt our way up the dizzy stairs. <laughs> Through a door left ajar, fully framed in a mirror, we saw nipples round as our mouths, secrets only told to our dogs. We lazed under lilacs, red clouds going by, never denied we were flat, spoiled, rotten, and ruined for good. Like Huck Finn, our hero back then, we too would have settled for a raft and gym, but we damn sure didn't want to run away. Those days are still a toy chest so filled that the lid can never be closed. Damn you, people are so nice. That's another thing. You know, it's another thing. It's like, uh, you know, when people, I, mean, I, I enjoy just reading and, and this silence and people absorbing it. But I'm not, and here it is. I'm trying to encourage you to applaud. Now. <laughs> but when people actually applaud for something, it's like, yeah, I mean, that's my inclination when I hear a song. It's like, why the hell wouldn't I want to fucking applaud? Uh, this one. This one is a, a poem I wrote after my dad died, which is kind of why I decided to, you know, sort of try and take myself seriously as a poet and at the same time say that you should never take yourself seriously as a poet, for Christ's sake. But uh, uh, he died, and I think that gave me an excuse to... Uh, to, to tell family secrets or something, maybe. So, I mean, because I, all of a sudden, I just opened up and, and went for it. That and the fact that he drank too much. Uh, he was an alcoholic. And, uh, and you know, the, the effects of that in a family situation, you, as a kid, you, you know what that's all about. And I didn't want to do that to my kids in a way that I thought, yeah, you probably ought to think about something other than being the, you know, I was a truck driver, kind of a <laughs> drugged out, smoking, <laughs> drinking, stupid, having fun guy. So, Family Plots is the title of this poem. Avoiding the work of weeding is a habit handed down from my dad, a piss poor farmer who'd only raised hell and a few eyebrows. <laughs> Panicky days, I wish I could be the good gardeners my brothers are. Plant some burgundy lupin or painted pansies neatly in short clipped grass. But I must find my own headstone, discover my faith in earth rich in blood as the sandy hole we dug on Petty Creek for the fired remains of our father. Funny. My old man liked reading cemetery markers, but wanted to be buried in a gunny sack. We did it wrong, left him bound in a strong plastic bag sealed inside a cardboard box. Dropped him square in the ground, staged a silly B-movie conclusion. Only mother's tears played right. Weeks later, my brother and I dug up dad, our final family plot as outlaw sons, afternoon grave robbers digging for gold dust and whispering our need to be good boys again. We cut the smothering shroud, freed his flinty ash, 
at last our skin and bones to breathe deeply the burlap, the soil and stone. We put him back in the dirt, sent him home. So, cute little book. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I feel like I'm, I should read from uh, these two collections of books. Uh, <laughs> this little collection, which is a Foothills Publishing book, which they do wonderful work. I'm involved with them as an editor in the, in the Montana Poets series, which I was involved in, and Dave Thomas was involved in, and uh, is there anybody, and Cheryl Nothy was involved in, is there anybody else in here? I, but I mean, everybody that's a poet in Montana hopefully will eventually be Mara. in that collection. Mara's Mara, where's Mara? Oh, she's she hiding, <laughs> Mara. See if I can see your face. Yeah, uh, so, so uh, they're a wonderful little, uh, little group. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, the, uh, this was published like uh, just before St. Patrick's Day 2020. Do you remember what that was? Yeah, right. They shut the world down the day before St. Patrick's Day. And so it kind of got lost in the shuffle. Uh, the photograph on the front... Yeah, I mean, how much would you pay for this? This is like a Kurt Russell photograph that's like, you know, amazing. And, and, and the inside, he was kind enough to include others that are only black and white. But so this is the benefit of producing something like a Foothills book is you can do, you can choose your cover, you can choose your art, uh, you can choose what goes on the inside of the book. You kind of have creative control. And I love that about this little quirky poetry publisher that, you know, they're not too exciting, but they make a goddamn good book of poems. Uh, so anyway, I should read something from in here, since it didn't get much airtime. This is one of them. At my first lesbian wedding, the clip-on yellow submarine-style John Lennon shades found in the jockey box of my mother's car after she died, provided the cover I needed to hide the streams of tears I shed, watching the likes of these two young lovers professing and celebrating their promise to care for one another in front of their families today, and for the life-till-death commitment of their sisters and brothers that full-on, crazy-ass family of friends who dance and sing down the aisle behind them, Mardi Gras style, under a ceiling of bright blue sky, the aisle being the parting of the crowd, those gathered witnesses for these twin hearts need to proclaim their decision to walk hand in hand to the end of the line, that beginning we don't understand. So they do it. They cheer, they dance and sing, they kiss, celebrate this thing, this vow, this marriage, a pact to sail stormy seas together, weather close quarters, sirens and morning breath, all hungers, temptations, tempests or thirsts, those old desires to jump ship at every port. We toast the dream to make this moment last. Hold on to the happiness of these love-struck fools, the parade of hoots and smiles, the hugs and laughs, now that the service is history and my first lesbian wedding is in the books. When I look at the vineless trellis, now standing alone in the meadow, a homemade latticework archway of sorts, hung with sheer curtains and made for the last outdoor family affair, a cousin's Christian marriage, guarded and guided by traditions and rules. I see how it provided a backdrop, a focal point, an opening, a frame. Call it a door for whatever illusion we choose to see or ignore. Help us to enter and 
write an old new story, one we can follow back for thousands of years. And still the breeze wafts with, still the breeze wafts the transparent linens lightly as it tousled the bride's blonde curls earlier when she stood before us and kissed her bride. And I leaked beneath the waves of this sweet green sea, happily grinning in my yellow submarine. <laughs> and I believe, because that's the way it seemed to me, God was busy as usual, just letting things be. <laughs> so I, thanks. I'll read one more from here. Uh, Actually, I'll read this. One of the things that's, uh, uh, well, I'm going to Ireland in October. My, my, my family is from Ireland. My grandparents came over from Ireland, and uh, my dad was born in Butte. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a big deal for me to do this, so I'm pretty goddamn excited about it. And... Uh, but one of, the, one of the permissions, as I mentioned earlier, that James Welch gave us to write about was our own life, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and he did it through sharing those poems, those, uh, those great poems that he wrote up in Harlem and Browning and, and wherever the hell he was when he wrote all those poems. But uh, So I wrote this poem as kind of a tip of the hat to him and what, what he had done. And, uh, and also sort of uh, go over ground that's both real and probably not real. You know, poets are liars. They're, they're good at, uh, at using the truth to lie. And, and so here it is. This poem is called Just Off the Interstate. When I first heard that Harlem poem, not Langston Hughes, but the one Jim Welch wrote about Harlem Montana, just off the reservation. I knew I could sing a booze anthem of my own for lost whiskey boys trying to kill old ghosts and resurrect broken souls, seals marooned on rocks of an unending storm, justify why there's no good reason not to say, fuck it, join in. Chase the pain away of not knowing or parading once again down the street in green, grinning like St. Patrick himself, blessing poverty and shame, licking that bipolar lollipop of blarney and hate, black blood bottled and blunt as a bleeding cunt, still pissy about last night's shattering glass, drunk as Welch's Indian, Indian bucks, who broke in and shot up the grocery before locking themselves inside to pass out rich as white men. We laugh because we laugh. That's what we know how to do. We don't know another way, so God, any God, the God damned and God blessed, why in hell do we still swill your blood? I woke up when I read that Harlem poem, although it was years before I gave up drinking my way into blackouts and blaming all troubles on God or money or the fucking Brits. One day I awoke to the power of songs and dreams, my need to tell stories of my tribe, like Bobby Harrington's appendicitis scar a knife wound carved by a butte high punk in the parking lot of the Marcus Daily. No cops, no hospital. Twenty years later, a poison pocket burst in his gut. He died watching Bullwinkle on TV. Or Martin Murphy's January breakfast inside his little trailer, sitting stone stiff as St. Anthony, head bowed, blue-gray but still gripping his jug of Walker's Ten High on the kitchen table, cup of, froze, cup of coffee frozen solid in the sink. That Harlem poem made me think maybe words 
stories were a way out of and a way into living, into giving up the bar stool in my head, that roll passed down by the fathers of the fathers, those survivors of the bogs and the fogs and the old sod. You know the tale, those sad heroes, stumbling, mumbling, falling down drunks, and yet another rendition of that Irish masterpiece. You can't kill me, you achieving bastard. I'm already dead. <laughs> Hi, diddle dee dee. Here's one, last one in here. Negative canon. Think of it. All the great poems we will never read. The uncollected gems. No one tried to publish or those groundbreaking verses submitted to fall on ears that couldn't hear their music or genius since no one had ever written it before, smiled at or applauded the blue, discomforting new, odd aberrations evoking miraculous celebrations that grew into the norm of the comfortable few, those modern, those modern, post-wandering, spontaneous rang foo we now crave, that anxious reach of ghostly poems, so edgy honest in their silence and loss, guaranteed to be packing their necessary form, the unsaid, the beautiful, the queer, a poem. So that's enough of that. <laughs> Better read a couple out of here. And uh, this summer, I should read this maybe. July. It's that time of year again when the birds sing us awake, when chipmunks chitter scat, and wildflower blossoms spatter meadows and hillsides, a brilliant array of moving color where cinnamon bears clamor up rock scree slopes and fawns scamper awkwardly after does through creek bottom shade in this place where the sun comes close and lights up our world for 18 plus hours a day. That naked time we live and swim outside. Come then in the season of rattlesnakes and ants, our haymaking stretch, that garden zone, when weather abides our souls and skin, soak in the springs, feel the burning cleanse of light and heat. Summer doesn't last long here, but then what does? Its fragrant beauty, like a bouquet of lilacs or roses, is momentary and intense. Meant to be indulged and embraced, digested immediately, completely savored before it's gone. Once we've passed on, fallen into autumn in those long, cold nights of winter, our July delights, redreamed and retold. We kindle that dark mercurial, will kindle that dark <laughs> mercurial march toward the lazy comfort of summer. This is an odd little thing, but I'll go ahead and read it because it's here. Uh, uh, in honor of, of, of Aaron's comment that you could just go from one page to the next, and these poems are just like, they're, they're great. I appreciate that, man. This is called Sonata Number 65. I think I was maybe 65. It's one of those days when I'm not completely in my body. Things aren't lined up. I'm off center a shade outside myself, a step behind or slipped over to one side like I'm out of alignment, about to lose my balance and land on my ass, not my feet. Feeling fragile, not agile, spaced out, not tuned in, almost anxious, but probably nothing a nap couldn't fix. <laughs> or, or at least it would be worth a try. 
I don't want to cry yet, but I do feel a tad bit lost, uneasy, certain that it's all in my head or the result of not being clearly placed, squared away in my space and in sync with my body electrical, neither mellow nor yellow as Donovan or Melanie, la laying down about bicycles, roller skates, or the hurdy-gurdy man, which is where I am most comfortable these days in the nickel tunes of dollar memories. Melodies transport me to locations fixed in those unhinged realities, my mind pockets of time, flashbacks that define the sharp edges of my existence before years of blurring brought me to this. The feeling of steel rails, the feeling of fading steel rails into sand, a letting go of the tracks and ties, the ballast and spikes, a loosening of my interest in rules and games, an eroding of all views and news, a caring less out loud, my coming to this chronicling of letting go, this quantum acceptance of what I know and don't know, this awareness that I don't know much at all. Yet it seems that maybe this aging process is helping me expand into death, that unknown, the unknowing of the self, our disintegration, that cracking of our shell to greet chaos, oblivion, eternity, the light, the dark, the more or less, heaven or hell or right or wrong, that simplified western either or song we've sung and danced to our whole life long. In the end, we're forced to move on, go with the flow the unfolding evolution of a universal design. Gravitas exploded, floating chips, the stream, all of it. Infinity, the impossible scheme, recycled, revealed, unheard, unseen. Fallout crescendo, this nucleic acid dream. See, see. Yeah, I've got I've got you hooked now. You have to applaud. <laughs> Set the hook. Expose. To write poetry is to know comfort, the temporary calm, security floating in the eye of the storm, to be left alone, the slipstream gatherer affording time one needs to imagine empathy, the privilege of dreaming, struggle and pain, chronicling the moment-to-moment -moment hunger and fear of those not born into the leisure you know. To write poetry is to act politically, record the language chosen by you to disguise and reveal what appears to be important, your view, completely aware no one has a clue. <laughs> and that's very true. Uh, oh, we're getting probably close. I mean, uh, I'm, I need to read a couple of things that are newer. I'll read. Uh, this one is in a rather morose part of the text. Uh, I mean, as if that's not three quarters of the goddamn text. But that's. You know, I, I think I've been watching my friend uh, James uh, Jay, uh, who's moved back here, wonderful poet and the publisher of my first three goddamn books. Uh, he uh, 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 he turned me on. He said, "Well, you have have you seen the Peaky Blinders?" And I'm like, well, "No, I hadn't." So now, have I seen the Peaky Blinders? I'm like, we, we can't. Like last night, what, Pam? Three or four. I mean, they're hour-long episodes. It's like, Jesus, I'm stuck in this, in this world of these brutal goddamn Irish. And uh, so, so here we go. This is another depressing uh, tale from my, uh, my past experience. 
Uh, and it kind of has to do with the old railroad town, sort of. Derailments. Looking back, I can't keep track. Never thought it would come, and now it's gone. Like you, still here in my head, like my mom. And it won't be long before we've all passed on. I keep expecting you, like her, to ring my bell. You're still walking and talking in my cranial hell bucket of bolts rattling around and taking me on time-traveling buggy rides through country only we knew. In our separate ways, those shared narratives we made to engineer our tales, make our claims, ultimately to entertain, packing our aloneness all the same years, our wheels keeping track, coming and going back, like us, never knowing why we are here, together in this bizarre mix of wonder and pain, inherited shit, holding on to each other only to let go, return to the fading comings and goings, these, old, these odd bonds, our attachments to each other, and our curiosities seem to be our best defense against omnipresent fear, inevitable despair, that black hole that calls us when we finally stop keeping track and the dust becomes us. So on a lighter note, one more on a lighter note. You can't, you can't stop there. This one at the end, uh, this is just called, this is at the end of the book. It's called Driven. And uh, it was uh, it was dedicated to uh, our friend Melissa Stevenson. If if you know Melissa, uh, you, you know she's a wonderful writer and poet. And uh, it's called Driven. The old man smiled at the precocious three-year-old serving him beer in the backyard gathering after the funeral. She worked the group like a skilled barmaid, <laughs> knew her cans and brands, remembering faces and orders without a hitch. He leaned toward me and whispered, she's been here before. <laughs> of course, it was a joke, but also a metaphor. He's Irish, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Though it was obvious, she literally knew a hams from a Budweiser, had done this before, he played up the ghostly myth that she was an old soul inhabiting a child's body. And I doubt he believed in reincarnation any more than he detested resurrection. But I loved the idea, the mystery. It made me think, imagine where she'd been. And what I remember from being a kid exposed to adults struggling and losing it the pains and pleasures of surviving shit, plus death, that ultimate trip, the exclamation point, all of it, signifying nothing. Those boys and girls who get that early education grow older than their years, getting to jump on the jaded journey. Many have turned to art to manage bouts of obsession and depression. Maybe she will. I know I began talking to myself at an early age. I started out addressing God, but got no response, so I became my own best listener. My friends are driven to chase music and movement, shape language and form, create images, sounds, rattle bones to ashes, dust the cosmic storm, and follow their dreams into the unknown. All right. I got a, I got a handful of newer stuff here, but I'll just read a couple of them. This one, uh, somebody said something earlier to me about... Uh, you know, I, I, in the last year, uh, our life has, you know, just like turned upside down in the last year. We, we, were in a, uh, we were in our place that we were in here in Missoula since we moved down here. We moved down here in 98, 
And, uh, and so anyway, we were there, and then all of a sudden, we got the news that we had to get out of there because we were renters. <laughs> I'm a poet, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it was like within a very short period of time. So that happened, and we were lucky enough to land in a place where a woman helped us, you know, be in, in, a, in an interim place for about six months or seven months or so, and in a rent that we could afford in that time frame. And uh, it was, but it was a, it was a, a kind of a high rise, not high rise, to me it was a high, if you're not on ground level, it's a high rise, right? <laughs> uh, you're on the third floor, it's a goddamn high rise to a, a man who's just in the dirt all the time. And uh, so we were up there and, you know, elevators and people all around and, you know, this way, it's a big horseshoe shaped of... Yeah, and I, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote a few things over there, and this is one of them. Oh, and this is, this is a dead giveaway, I guess, because the title is actually the name of that particular spot, which is not a bad spot, and we were really glad to be there. <laughs> but it wasn't where I really wanted to be. Riverfront Park View. <laughs> the lick and gurgle of water over stones soothes my anxiety being just what it was designed to be, an invented sanctuary, distracting as art. The herons stand still on the bank of this little brook, this runnel, creek, or rill, unperturbed, dead to all sirens and the lack of fish in this piped-in rivulet. Sculpted metal, they watch, masked by native shrubbery in this sweetly landscaped glade of serenity built for me and my fellow condo residents. Urban dwellers seeking the comfort of nature, the not-so-wild outdoors, need only open a window or better yet, take the elevator down to lawn level. And if we dare to venture past the benches and underground sprinklers bordering the winding <laughs> promenade, trade this man-made arboreal garden of peace for a stroll outside the courtyard perimeter and on to the floodplain. We'll take the dirt trail through weeds that leads down to the river where dead fish reek on the rocks and bring us closer to the real story the dirty one we choose to insulate ourselves from, the one we try to ignore, since it stinks like hell and smells to high heaven, our closet of death, skeletons, and unknowns. This, uh, I just... Today, and I was looking at my email, the, today was the day that the Montana Arts Council State of the Arts magazine comes out. And if you ever look at that, it comes out four times a year. It kind of tells you about what's going on with all the different arts uh, in the state of Montana, as far as the Arts Council goes. And, um, and this poem I, uh, I sent to uh, Eric, asked for me to send something, and so I sent him this poem, and that's, that's what was in there. So I found this today in that, and I thought, oh, I better read that. I and it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a goofy, a goofy thing. But then I'm a goofy guy, and it's uh, it's dedicated to Sam Cooke and Bob Dylan, <laughs> terrific poets. It's called Change Gang. Change is on the horizon. Change is under the bed. Change is in my pocket. The past is present dead. Change the record, change your socks. Change direction, change the locks. I want to change the system. I want to change the world. I want to change men's minds, have them think like little girls. Change in a spiral, turning slow, sundown to sun up, round and round. Change will come, though change won't go. Change is still, change is lost till it's been found. Change is the constant noun state of it. Yet we want to rule. We want to act. Verb up the present. Expand. 
contract, change the rivers to borders, damn fluid to fact. Praise beauty comfort, those on board, ignore the smoking wasted crude, burning ships, drunk on the blues, a bloody harbor of black and bruised. Time for change, to move, express, a means to calculate your success. Time to rock superstition, go west, open the baggage in your chest. Change it up, change it up now, everybody chants. Time to change it up, your cozy habit stance and disallow that unhappy, happy hour rut. Change it up, baby. Tune in to sound, roll in the meadow, smell the ground, strip off your clothes, feel rain on your skin, taste mouth, breath, pleasure, just slip it in. Go out, go in. You can change it, you can change if you move into the deep blue, so make up your mind, your heart, hear the chain gang depart to arrive awakened, and free to find. You're making art out of you, the beat with no clear idea of what's happening on your bumbling awareness of feet, oddly calm on the threshold of gone. Your fear of stepping through that door may be salved by age, some wisdom of more moments accumulated in this life so strange, embracing the inevitable arrival of change. And on that note, uh, uh, the, the Poet Laureate will change here very shortly into another individual who will hopefully, you know, uh, keep you all entertained in the way that we do it because of our <laughs> extravagant budget. Right? We're just like everywhere. You can't miss us because because I don't even get me started on that. Uh, I, I'll read one more because it's here and I'm just greedy. I can't sh sh shut up, you know. It's like, uh, no, it's this one, uh, this one is, I mean, a lot of times uh, I, I like to, uh, you know, what, is, what inspires you to read? Well, I mean, you get out of bed in the morning and, and that stuff happens to you all day long, and so there's bound to be something in there that sticks in your head, which is what we do. That's where, that's where we find things to, to write about, I guess. But a, a lot of times, m music is, is a great inspiration uh, for poems, and most of you probably are, are jazz uh, educated, and you know about a, a record called Kind of Blue. This, this poem is just called Kind of Blue. That comfortable blue, a soothing rainy day melancholy blue, brushes and bass slow and low. Under Evan's soft piano, we stroll into miles, oh so open solo blue. Muted Coltrane follows through, light cannonball riffs, two reflections, the Janus face of it. Doors open to change, are the perfect circle of souls passing to spin and land, lift off again, forge ahead, feeling in the dark with hands and heart. We dance inside the music ourselves, saxophone and trumpet, lead us on, pull us through. But it's the rhythm, that downbeat, beat down, heartbeat rhythm, the blue foundation for blue-toned souls, thoughtfully resting, quietly searching, not sleeping, we are dreaming, a uh, who are you kind of blue. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh yeah. Thank you. Th th thanks for coming. Oh, God, you're, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, he deserves it. Uh, anyway, it, it, I, you know, I, it is the, uh, this is the, the final sort of uh, uh, deal with uh, Humanities Montana. And if, in fact, uh, anybody wants to know anything 
uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes. I can, uh, I can give you that information. <laughs> I have it all. Or, or we can just say to hell with this and all go home and get something to eat or whatever else you want to do. <laughs> Anybody have a question or anything that you want to talk about? Ooh. In your monumental series of videos with poets throughout Montana, how many did you interview on your show? Uh, so far, I think there's like 61. Yeah, and 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 and, and uh, Aaron Parrott was holding on to a book when he was here earlier that Drum Lumman published by by Alan uh, Jones. Alan, what's his middle name? Morris. Morris. Alan Morris Jones. A new book of poems uh, called Mumble Cusser, which is a great book of poems. <laughs> it's a great book of poems, uh, and I'm going to talk to him next week, so he'll be 62. Right. But uh, I, I think I'll keep doing that because it's fun. And, and there's just so damn many poets in the state, right? And Craig Turi. Oh, my God. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah, he was fun. <laughs> you can't corral him. <laughs> no, no. And he was, you know, the other day he was, he, he was here uh, on video when, when uh, the, the publisher, Michael Zarnecki, was in town. And I couldn't resist because he got this brand new pair of glasses. I made some kind of a smart-ass comment to him about looking like Dorothy Kilgallen. <laughs> and, and I thought, that really probably wasn't very nice. But you know, so much of the humor that we grew up with is not really nice at all. we are kind of mean. Anyway. I love those videos. Yeah, they are good. I, I, I've, I've watched them all. I, no, I mean, literally sat through them, but then I, I watched them all, and I, I dug them. I thought they were all good. They were all different. So if you don't know what we're talking about, there is a uh, MCAT uh, who's here today. Ron Scholl, uh, uh, shooting these videos, is here today. And, and there's the, they have a YouTube site, MCAT Community Television. And if you go to the playlist thing on the MCAT site, you'll see Poets in Montana. And there's like... 60 some videos there and there'll probably be more because we don't have to stop, right Ron? <laughs> no, we, we, can, we can keep doing it. Yeah. And they're fun. David was there. Yeah. Cheryl and Sean and I kind of keep looking around. There's all these names. All right. Nothing else? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah.